Oh, that's weird. I didn't know it announced it. All right. Ready, Lisa and Christy? Okay. Well, welcome everybody um, to our Authors on Tap reading series. I'm Kristen, and along with Javier, who's in the back room manning the behind the scenes, we run Exile and Bookville, which you can see behind us, and beautiful Michigan Avenue in the backdrop. Tonight, we are beyond ecstatic to host Lisa Tadeo, um, author of Animal and Free Women, and Exile VIP Christy Tate, author of Group. So we're we're proud of all of the authors that we have and all of the events we have, but I had to fight Javier off in order to host this event. Three Women was a book, and it still is a book, that I push into as many hands as possible. And when Animal came out, um, here's the advanced reader copy, when it came out, that was the first book I grabbed out of the box, and it is so good. And I was talking to Christy earlier when she came by the store, I read it months and months and months ago, and I still think of that book, Animal, to this day. It is so haunting, and on my rec card, I talk about how haunting it is and how much I just want to have a cocktail with Joan, um, the main character. It's just such a fantastic book, so the fact that I'm sitting here talking to Lisa about Animal and introducing this is bizarre, and it makes me want to have another cocktail, so <laughs> thank you both for being here. Just a quick bio of the two of them, not that anyone needs to know about them because everyone should. Lisa Tadeo is the author of the instant New York Times bestseller, Three Women. Um, she has contributed to the New York Times, New York Magazine, Esquire, Elle, Glamour, and so many other publications. Her nonfiction has been included in the Best American Sports Writing and Best American Political Writing anthologies. And her short stories have won two Pushcart Prizes. Lisa lives with her husband and daughter in beautiful New England. And Exile VIP Christy Tate is a Chicago author whose essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, uh, McSweeney's, The Rumpus, and other places as well. Her debut memoir, Group, was published in October 2020 by Avid Reader Press. And it was a Reese Witherspoon selected novel for the November Book Club. And her paperback was just released June 1st. And we will be having an event with Christy to celebrate her paperback release in a few weeks. So um, as I've been showing you, we have signed copies of Group, Three Women, and Animal um, on hand at the store. So swing by, get yours, call us, email us carrier pigeon pony express you can purchase these books and we ship all over the united states so come on down and say hi or give us a call and we'd be happy to ship one to you um, as i said at the beginning if you have any questions please feel free to type them into the chat or use the raise hand function i don't it appears elsewhere on everyone's screen but the raise hand function near the end and you can yeah, ask your question directly um, again, feel free to leave your cameras on, but please mute yourself until the Q&A portion. And um, I'm going to stop talking because nobody came to hear me talk and enjoy the event. I, I really can't tell you how much Animal is such a fantastic novel. Christy will tell you, and Lisa, you know it is because you wrote it. And I could sit here and quote too many passages to you. The book is fantastic. So pick it up and enjoy the event. and. Take it away, Christy and Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Javier and Kristen, for having us. And Lisa, welcome. Um, I feel so grateful to you for this book. Um, it's exactly how I felt grateful to you when Three Women came out and everyone in my office was reading it, the men, the women. It was a law office. There were, every conversation was about it. And I feel like now I'm missing that because of the pandemic, there is no water cooler in which to gather. So these events um, really give me a chance to talk to people about, the, about your work. Um, and what I wanna say is I read your book in March and it was at the peak of my languishing and I had been vaccinated and I, there was hope on the horizon, but for some reason it made me understand all that I'd missed. And 
I got a copy of Animal and Advanced Reader Copy, and it was so electrifying. I feel like it was like those CPR paddles that bring a, bring a body back to life. And I've had that experience before with memoir, and I'd never had it with a novel before. And it really, so it has a really special place for me and, and my pandemic life. And also part of me coming back to the Psalm Nebulous was awakened by Joan in her story. And I just wanna say, thank you. It means so much to me. And for anybody who's on here who hasn't read the book yet, um, can you just give like, you gave such a beautiful explanation or your elevator pitch of your book when you talked to Raven Leilani. Um, I think that's a great way to start the conversation. How do you describe this book and Joan and, and what the work is about? Oh God, I forgot what I said to Raven Leilani. Was that one of the good things that I said or <laughs> I remember? Um, I, you know, it, it's about a woman um, who has this, the, this man shoots himself in the face in front of her and it is, um, and she's having dinner with a married man when it happens. And this is another married man. And that's kind of the first moment we meet Joan is in this kind of this moment of absolute, just, you know, someone kills themselves in front of her. And so she's kind of driven to change her life or, or to, to rather to go and seek this other part of her life and this key to her past. Um, and, and the, the, the book is this her journey from being someone who had been put upon to somebody who kind of has to stopped, want, stopped caring about what people think about her and has in essence turned into the animal that we all are. Yeah, that's, that's as good as what you said to Raven Leilani. <laughs> Yay. Um, and what, in that conversation, one of the things you said was, I love this, you said that one of the things you saw Joan doing is moving through rage to hope. And the question that I thought of, I've been thinking about that line, do you think that it's possible to get to hope without rage? Or what's your understanding of the relationship in the book or, or for women or oppressed people? To get, what's the relationship between rage and hope? You know, in, in my own life and in a lot of, of those people that I know that have kind of been been to the bottom and sort of come out the other side is that often at least mostly in my own experience it's like you really need to get to the bottom sometimes in order to um to get out to, to really to really to really make a change that's going to have a sort of holistic um effect over the rest of your life sometimes you need to have seen how bad it it is or can get uh, and that's definitely where what Joan needs in, and she needs to get to the bottom in order to to sort of see her way to getting to the top. And it's not that she's even wanting. I think that the reason that people make such a a a, a great climb from the very bottom is because you kind of have to sort of heave yourself in a very like wild manner. And if we're kind of in a sort of stasis in in our lives and and where we're at. I don't think that we make a climb that is as as um, propulsive, and so I, I feel that, at least in my own experience, and certainly in, in in so many people that that I've spoken to, when you see such a, a market sort of from bottom to top, there's there's a real muck that you've been in in order to have to propel yourself out of it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I I agree with that. That's what I was I was hoping you would say that. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's also uh, good to, it's just, it's help for me. I kind of need to believe that too. You know, it's like, you kind of like, if there's a reason that we get sent to the depths, like it, it'd be nice if there were a reason. Right. So it's kind of yes. like, you want there to be a reason, but I do, I do believe that, but I also, it helps me to believe that at the same time. Yeah. It reminds me of the Adrian Rich poem about the shipwreck. You have to go all the way to the bottom and then exactly. when you when you when you emerge, you sh you share the gifts of submersion with other people, and that's part of the work of that's part of the work of hope and spreading hope, which is exactly what I think Animal does. And a lot of the conversations about this book have to do with female rage, and mm -hmm. I'm so here for it. It's so long overdue. 
one of my frustrations with the Me Too movement is that I'm grateful for it. It started really important, it, it unveiled some important power dynamics that everybody knew was there, but it exposed some wrongdoing by men, criminal behavior, et cetera. But a lot of the conversations seem to offer lip service to this notion of female rage. And what I what I loved about Animal is I, I, there was a part of me that as I was reading, I was like, so scared at some point you were gonna pull back. Like, please don't pull back. Please don't pull back. Like, please lean, let have Joan lean all the way in. Let it make, I wanted to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. because what I see in my own experience of my own rage, the rage of my daughter, the rage of my female friends, I love it in theory. And when it comes at me or I experience it, mm -hmm. I still am so afraid there's not enough stories. There's not enough. You've kicked down the door wider with animal, but we need more. And I'm just wondering if you feel like when you were writing this, did you ever have the impulse to like sanitize or like sort of like round out some of Joan's edges or some of these experiences or was it was it as scary to write as it is to read what this really what is trauma and rage and moving through hope what it really looks like it's so messy and i'm just wondering how you grappled with that as you as the story unfolded for you yeah you know that's a really great question christy i feel that um i i did i was i was i i wasn't i didn't really round out anything nor did I didn't I certainly didn't want to um for any other reason than I was worried and and still am worried about the notion of of alienating people with too much rage which is the very thing that I wanted to sort of talk about so it's interesting that that would be the thing that I would also worry about but there's all like one of the things with with three women that I was so conscious of was um, you know, I've, and I've talked about this before, but I feel like, you know, one of the women, um, uh, several of the women who weren't in the book, but there were a lot of mothers with suicidal ideation. And, you know, I was worried in three women um, that talking too much about that would alienate a reader from wanting to read more about a woman who is also a mother, because as a mother, yeah. she has to not think about those things or, or have any kind of any, you know, we, we need women to be only mothers. And it's, it's part of, it's like this, like this fairy tale that, and I'm not saying I, I don't have the same feeling. I, I wanted the same from my mother. I want to be that for my kid. Like I want to be this like stereotypical mom, but we have impulses to the contrary. And I think that denying those and feeling terrible about those and not seeing them in fiction or in nonfiction is really detrimental. Um, you know, we've just started talking about postpartum depression in the past couple of years in any kind of a way. Now it's like doctors are, you know, always like, oh no, you can keep taking the antidepressant, you know, cause now they do that, right? But yeah. years ago it was like, but, and, but we still have so, and I'm not, you know, talking anything about pharmacology cause I don't know what I'm talking about. But what I do think is that we don't, we don't make those, we make only the barest minimum of allowances because of, you know, who has committed suicide because of X, Y, or Z. So now we're like, oh, okay. Sometimes people do that. So let's just, let's let people know that we, we might be there for them <laughs> if they need yeah. us, but we go only as far as we need to to satisfy the statistic. And, um, yeah. and, and I think, and so, so for me, I, I was, so because I left a lot of that stuff out of three women, I left it out, not like, not really, um, not not because of what I thought people would think about the book, but because I was kind of conscious the whole time of like, I want everyone or a reader to empathize with this woman to to really to sort of like cut off all of her window dressings and just feel what she's feeling. Um, and with Animal, I, I wanted the same, but I also felt because it was fiction, I, I wasn't as worried. About, I wasn't as worried about Joan as I was about you know Lena. Maggie and Sloan, you know, I was, um, I was not worried about Joan because she, I, I made her and I can kill her as my mother used to say about me, <laughs> which maybe gives you a little insight into um, how Joan's mom is so fucked up. But no, I mean, my mom, you know, my mom has, has, um, that's another thing. My mom, I'm very, I'm very, I was talking to Stephanie Downer the other day who said that my book was about 
the monstrosity of motherhood, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. And I didn't warn her that I was going to steal it, but I'll, I'll shoot her an email and, and tell her, but I am, I'm, I mean, I'll give her credit for it, but I think that's, that's so something that I'm so interested in. Um, not even in my own, I have a child, but not even with her more so with the, the memories that I have of my own mom and the way that I wanted her to be a certain kind of mom and those societal pressures that I, you know, put on her because of what I saw moms and commercials doing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, so that for me is, is a real, uh, is, is something that I really find, um, I find really just poignant and, and I just want to talk about it and think about it. And I am scared to talk about it because I'm scared of pushing people away at the same time that I want them to sort of have the conversation with me. Absolutely. I totally relate. I feel bereft when I think about the stories that are not told because of motherhood, my own included. I just, I, I've dipped my toe a little bit in there and I, I had my own demons to slay and then lots of other outside voices came to me and it's interesting that you mentioned Stephanie Danler I heard her on a podcast the pop fiction women podcast oh yeah I just did that with them they're fantastic so smart so smart all praise to the complicated woman and the conversation that actually reminded me a lot of um, this of some of the conversation around animal is um, Stephanie Danler was talking about you know along the lines of Oh, we say we like complicated women, women because we have Fleabag, but Fleabag is one show. It was yeah. two seasons, eight yeah. episodes. Yeah. Where's the, where's the Don? We've got Don, John Draper and Tony Soprano, and I'm not a big TV person. So I like, we've already hit my limit of <laughs> There's protagonists. A lot. <laughs> so, but I really, and I know that you've had experience in show business as well. And I really want to believe, like I heard Stephanie say that on the podcast and I rewound and I was like, no, it can't be that there's only room for like beautiful Phoebe Waller bridge to, to be quirky and stare at the camera. Like I want to see animal on the big screen. I want to see, and I want to see all the progeny of, of these stories. And what do you think about the, do you think that there's more room now? Like, where do you stand on, oh, we're making so much progress, but like, I really get irked when I think about everybody likes to talk about Fleabag and maybe Promising Young Woman, right? That's also a really wonderful example of rage and channeling it. Yeah. But I still feel like this isn't enough. No, it's, you know, it's wild. Um, I I feel like the, the just t t talking to some readers and kind of hearing from them. And I, I find that to be one of the most interesting and also like horrifying parts of, of the job, you know, where it's like, oh, wow. Oh, oh, look, all these readers. And then you're like, oh, wow. Readers really don't want a certain kind of, of woman. And it's weird. And it's like, you know, um, do I think we're making progress? No, not in that department. And I think, and I also think it's like, we're making sure that we're not making progress yeah. in a sense. It's like, you know, it's like the second you kind of go um, off into and dip your toes into something a little bit, you know, female Gothic, people are like, whoa, whoa, that's crazy. You know, someone made the point the other day to me, I forgot who it was, but they were saying that like, you know, for years we've had the blue liquid um, dripping onto the menstrual pad, you know, and yet we like turn the channel and it's like wild gore, but it's like female, mm -hmm. like child rearing blood. It's like, ah, <laughs> don't show that. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're still so, we're still so there. We still have such problems with that. And it is a lot of lip service. And then we find, like you said, Fleabag, which is obviously fantastic, but we find the most comestible versions of mm -hmm. things we can possibly take um you know and 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 we and we just and then we we fly those flags and say look we're okay with all this stuff but it's no it's because then you know they go home at night those same people and they're like oh but she's such a whore isn't she because I I saw that with three women all the time I mean I would do these book clubs with these women and I would just drop into these book clubs and they were like you know I the first like 30 minutes I'm like oh wow this is so fun and then invariably somebody would be like you know drinking a Mountain Dew and go like but come on they're just whores right <laughs> like, like 
like a certain point. And it was like this, it really broke my heart because yeah. I felt so, um, you know, not quite like that, but, but also like that, like, you know, in, in not in so many words and also in those words. And, um, and it's just, and so with animal, I, I kind of knew, you know, I knew that that was, that's kind of where, um, or, uh, you know, the thing is, it's like, it's either be super positive, be this type of a, it, it, the point is still that a woman needs to fit into one of these molds that we've already seen pitched to us. And it's, it has to be a formula. And if it's a bad woman, it has to fit in this bad woman who is saved by X or bad woman who will never be saved. And we can just call her a whore forever. Like it's, it's just, it's always got to be something we've seen before in the second that there's any kind of complexity. I think people get really like hot around the collar and uncomfortable about it. Yeah. Oh, and I would love to talk about complexity. One of the things that has come up in my conversations about animal is I'll start talking to someone about it and then we'll be talking about the trauma. And then I'll realize, wait, which trauma are you talking about? <laughs> yes. No, wait, which trauma are you talking about? And I, I, there, there are obviously a constellation of traumas for Joan. And, you know, that to me mirrors real life. I don't know any woman who's only had one trauma. I don't know. I, it doesn't, maybe that's a thing. And I'd like traumatic, traumatized people, but I think that the truth is um, sexual assault most, most people have, ex most women I know have experienced more than one. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was really fascinating and so well rendered. And the question that I have for you about that is, what, this is something I think about a lot. I read the book in March and then I read it again this weekend. And I keep thinking, even if the, the trauma where, um, when I speaking, the one that happened when Joan was 10 and um, the loss of her parents, um, the, the irrevocable loss of her parents. Even if that had not happened, I keep thinking to myself, like, she'd still be really messed up in yeah. this way. Yeah. Uh, like, she'd still not fit. She wouldn't, she would still be in the, in the sidelines of a certain kind of femininity society. And I was just wondering, like, if you, agree, I was like, I don't know, it, there's something about it that's felt heretical, like, but I really feel like the story is set up for me not to think that the tragic and, and gruesome and tra traumatic loss of her parents, like, there was also a lot of grief, even if that hadn't happened. And I'm just wondering if that's, and do you think she would have still stolen those shoes <laughs> had her parents lived? I mean, if they still lived, she would still have really serious issues. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's, uh, I mean, I think, uh, would she still have stolen the shoes? Yeah, probably. I think the shoes might've been a, like that might've been fulfilling a different trauma. I think that's a really yeah. good um, way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, you know, f for me, I, I think not, I think, I mean, I know because it's me but, <laughs> um, with, with grief. Uh, I, a lot of Joan's rage um, does come from grief. And what's funny is I was talking to this, um, this woman from the UK the other day who was like, who literally, no joke, had like seven ciders while we were talking. And I was just like, I was, she's like, sorry, it's, it's five o'clock here. I'm like, no, no, it's cool. I'm not, it was just amazing. It was so British, but she was like, you know, sometimes I think that my anger at men um, comes from my grief over, the, the losses that I've suffered and I kind of channel it into, you know, and, and I don't, uh, for Joan, I think that's something that she, um, that she definitely does with her grief is, is it turns into a rage. And I think often the grief of loss is the idea of like, why did that person go and not this person? Or why is that person dead and not me? And, and that's a classic kind of, you know, and that's something that I certainly had a lot. I mean, I remember after my father died, I was like, you know, in some gas station and this like guy like just was such an asshole. And I just, it was like a couple of days after my dad died and I was like, why wasn't it you? 
you know, and yeah. that's like a real, like, and I just had ra- like, that was probably one of the, my biggest sources of rage is that would be the feeling. I don't do that anymore when I get angry at people, but for a while, for a good, like, I don't know, six months to a year, I would walk around thinking, why wasn't it you whenever somebody like was a little bit annoying. <laughs> you know, like I was just like, why are you here? Um, and, and so, and so I think, you know, but, but we, but it's hard to deal with that kind of grief. And so we do often have to like channel it into things that are more present. Um, But for Joan, what you said just makes such sense and is exactly what, what I intended for the character is that she does have these different channels that she gets the rage from. But at the end of the day, the reason it's so all consuming is because she has been hit from so many sides. Yeah, I just, I, I, it was reminding me of Jeannie Vanasco wrote a memoir, What We Didn't Talk About When I Was a Girl, about sexual, a, a particular sexual assault. And then there were uh, two other ones. And sh- I heard her say that people kept saying, like, why do you think you got sexually assaulted so often? And she was like, <laughs> excuse me, why is that the question? Which made me think about, like, you know, I felt by the end of the book, I felt really protective of Joan. Like, I really felt like, and it felt, I felt like, oh, I'm going to, anytime anyone asks me, anytime about the, the question I hate the most, like the likable, likable characters, I, I, I don't even, I'm not going there. But what I would say is I want female characters who are smart. I want them to be witty and I want them to do things. Yeah. And like, that's kind of my bar. And I, I like, that's the threshold, let's say it that way. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I would love to, for you to talk about, I haven't heard any, haven't heard any discussion about this, is Joan's relationship to food. Yeah, she, there are so many. She, I've not, there are so many great meals she has, <laughs> and she cooks, and with everything psychically on her plate, like how she whipped up a meal for Leonard, I was super impressed. And obviously, food food was important in in the ways that it connected her to lovers and her parents, her mother, her aunt. And I just want to hear what what that meant to you, because it really, especially that my second time through, I was like, this is really an interesting part of this that really, it really sang to me. Wow. Well, thank you. I, you know, I'm really interested in, in food. Um, I come from a mom who, you know, was a big um, you know, cook and, and it hated to eat, but loved to cook, which was, you know, one of the many complexities. Um, and, uh, and I just really, I love food. I love reading about food and novels. I, I think food is one of the most, um, the easiest ways to evoke, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of feeling. And with Joan, I wanted, you know, what I really loved about Joan, what I, what I wanted Joan to have was a sort of um, a, a sense of the sort of good life, but also kind of like, 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 cause it's more tragic when you know what's good, but you can't have it. And that's part of everything. She kind of knew what love was that was good too, because she had had something with her parents, but then, you know, the things that her father did, et cetera. Um, so there's always this sort of feeling of like knowing what's right, knowing what's good, but being unable to, to capture it. And that I, that I wanted to add to the sort of, you know, I also just like, you know, much like, um, much like, and I don't, I'm not comparing Joan to Hannibal Lecter, but much like Hannibal Lecter and, you know, there's always, there's characters that, um, I like to hang out with when they're not the nicest people because they know what a good place to get caviar at 11 p.m. I think that's a valuable asset in in a character and in a human being. So I wanted Joan to have that. Yeah, I loved that. I I love that for her. And I thought, man, I got to step up my game. (laughs) If if Joan can cook like this, I better better get some fresh (laughs) vegetables up in here. Um, (laughs) um, I also... um, one of the places where I feel like luxury really came to into her consciousness was through her aunt. And I, the, I, I, Chris and I were talking last week, or maybe it's Monday, I don't know, about Animal and how I read it. When I read it in March, I probably thought about it every single day as well. And I think about the aunt so much. And I think one of the most devastating lines in the book was she's describing, Joan is describing her aunt as um, at living with a casual woman friend. And I'm like, oh, okay, she's 10. She's been through a lot. I don't love that for Joan, but okay, it's cool. Uh, but then she says of her aunt, she let me grow up alone. And I was like, 
I thought that was the point in the book where I just felt like I'm wrapping my arms around Joan and I'm going to go, I'm going with her psychically. I felt the impulse to mother her mm -hmm. in a way that I, I don't normally, I, it was like a different sensation for me. And I think that's like, I think it was really important. There wasn't a sentimental, there's no sentimentality of like the kindly aunt, mm -hmm. like made up for all the, or, or tried or did her best. Like not for a second. I mean, she gave, I do think she gave gifts to Joan, but I don't think they were the, the sort of redemptive aunt B that I was sort of expecting of this aunt. And I guess I just want to hear about your experience of, of that relationship and what it meant to you. You know, I, um, I wanted Joan to have, um, a sort of a, a person in her corner, but also not so much in her corner because the way that Joan grows up is kind of, you know, and I do think, and I, I, I lost my parents, not at the age that Joan did, but, um, in a sense, I think that whenever you, when you do lose both of your parents, especially if you are younger than you're kind of quote unquote supposed to be or whatever, um, you, you are kind of alone, you're kind of alone in the world. And, and even with other family, it's still, there is still something that, you know, is going to be, um, it, you're going to feel some, and I've seen a couple of people like that. And I've, you know, seen it in, in myself, even though I was much older, there's, there's a, there's kind of a scraping that happens mm. and it's hard um, for anyone to, to fill that gap in the same way. And so I wanted her aunt to be someone who, who helped her sort of see, um, you know, just a, 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 a certain kind of, of woman who I've met a, a good number of when I was single and, and living in New York city I, there were a lot of like women, older women than me that I was kind of always like, oh, could this be my mom? <laughs> could this be her? <laughs> like, how much older are you than me? 12 years? Oh, that might be a little too young. Um, but, but there were a lot of, you know, um, just, just really cool older women. And, and, and that's, and that's kind of the, the kind of um, guide post that I wanted Joan to have, which, which felt, which felt like the, the, not, obviously she could have had more, but there's kind of something about, um, so there, there's something to be said for holding things at a distance when you've already lost so much. And I think that that's kind of exactly what she needed in the story. But I'm really happy with what you're saying about like wanting to take care of her and liking her. I think it's, I think, you know, it, a lot of people who have been like, oh, wow, you know, I found myself really wanting to, to read about her, even though like I hated her. And I'm like, oh, why'd you hate her? You know, not, like it's, to me, it's like, it's weird because, um, I, I, I have, I guess, and, and this is something Stephanie said the other night too, that was really true of me. I really do lean into, um, the human side of evil. I find it so yeah. intoxicating and, and not, and, and really the human side of evil, meaning that it's what we perceive as evil, but which is just kind of the most scared parts of ourselves. Yeah. You know? And I saw that a lot in group, you know, that kind of idea of like, you know, just this idea of, of letting people be the, the complex beings they are without apologizing for it as though there is something that could have been done. Like, you know, Joan, right. all these things have happened to Joan, yet she could have done. X. It's like, no, well, she couldn't because you know what, this is what she did. And, and that's the story. <laughs> and, and so for me, you know, I've never looked at someone and not felt some, I, you know, I think it's to my detriment. Sometimes I, I always look at people and feel something, um, it, it, even if they're doing something really bad, I'm always like, oh, I kind of, I kind of understand that. Um, and, and I think it's a real, it's a real showing thing, I think, to not like someone who has been through a lot and is being honest about how they kind of feel destitute about everything. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine not admiring someone who's hustling. I don't know. Joan is my uh, people. What can I say? <laughs> I have I do not apologize for that. Um, we do have a question from Christina, and I don't want to ignore. Um, this is a great question. So Christina says, I've become so protective of this book via bookstagram. There's so much bicker and banter about trigger warnings regarding animal. 
whose responsibility is it to bring trigger warnings to readers' attention? The publisher, the author, marketing? Um, that's the question. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. That's such a great question. Um, you know, I think well, trigger warning for, you know, when I was finishing my MFA, um, that they were just starting to implement that or something. They were on the top of every short story before you read it. Um, they were going to put uh, the trigger warnings like at the top of, of like, you know, these student short stories that whoever and you didn't have to read them if one of the trigger warnings bothered you, which I wish they had done for when I was whatever. <laughs> Sometimes I was really tired and I might have had some trigger warnings that I couldn't deal with. But I mean, for me, my dad, I lost my dad in a car accident and there was at least, you know, five or more years where I could not watch anything with a car accident. I couldn't hear about a car accident. I couldn't, you know, I just, if I knew there was a movie with the, there's, there's movies I still have not seen, like I think 21 Gram. Well, well, uh, there's just, there's a good amount of movies that I haven't seen. Then my mom got cancer and I was like, all right, I'm done with cancer, no illness. So, you know, and I just keep cutting stuff out and I'm kind of gradually coming back around to things many, many years later. But I have a lot of triggers and I also have hypochondria. Like I, there's just things I do not want to hear about. I still have friends who text me when someone has died, like some celebrity. And I'm like, do you not know who I am? I don't want to hear yeah. that. Like that is not, go tell your other friends about that. I'm like now you've ruined my fucking day. Um, but, but there's so many trigger warnings. You know, I don't know. One person's trigger warning is another person's non-trigger warning. It's hard. There are a lot of trigger warnings in, in animal, um, you know, but there's also, I mean, there's also a lot of people who want to hear the things that are trigger warnings for, there are people for whom trigger warnings are things that make them feel less alone, you know, and I know that yeah. from three women, I know that from, from animal, even in its kind of infancy. And I think that, um, and that's what makes me feel comfortable in, in writing through a, a trigger warning. And because they're like, I mean, I just don't think these days there's there's anything that some people are okay with people being killed, but not with dogs being killed. You know, it's yeah. like, what, what is, we all, and at the end of the day, also it's fiction, you know, and at the end of the day, fiction is, is you know, is life in disguise. And we, we can't, you know, we need to be able to talk about the things that we want to talk about. There's other people who want to talk about them with us. And then there's people who, who, you know, don't like, I've started reading a book and watched a movie that had a car accident in it that I've been bummed out that I've had to see, you know, <laughs> but like, but it's not the person who wrote it's fault. And, and I don't want there to stop being car accidents out there. Cause I know that one day I'm going to want to see them again or not see them again, but talk to people who have been through them. And, you know, there's, there's a car accident in animal. That's pretty, um, that's pretty graphic. And for me, it was kind of like, it was that stuff. Um, and that's like you, what you said about someone asking you, um, if, uh, asking you, shoot, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, but, um, sorry. Anyway, there, the reason there's an accident in animal in the sort of way that it, it is, is because things happen. Oh, you said, why did some, why, why, why are you, were you assaulted so much? Someone said to someone you knew, right? So it's that same thing. It's like, well, why there are people who have seen a lot of fatal car accidents. There are people who have lost people to several fatal car accidents. There's a lot of stuff out there. And we, each of us have our threshold of what we can and, and can't see and don't want to see. But I, I think it's, it, it's, it's tricky territory. Um, I don't know whose responsibility it is to say whether or not there's a trigger warning. I certainly do not think it's the writer's responsibility to write a, thinking about future trigger warnings because that could be anything. Right. I also, I have a question some, somewhat related about the title. I think it's a perfect title. My question is, did you ever have any other titles for the book? Like that first time you sit down to write a scene, save doc, did you call it animal? Or were there were there other iterations and can we hear them? Um, I when it was my thesis statement, it was called the overheated house, um, which sounds very pompous and um, and and weird. But now thinking because animal is so much simpler and 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 different. But it was um, it was you know for me the 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 feeling of um, suffocating heat 
was something that has always stayed with me. I mean, I've always been afraid to be hot. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and, and I've been hot, you know, I had, I had, I spent, my parents did not like to turn the air conditioning on. They said it like, they didn't like, they liked fresh air, or whatever. I'm sure that meant that, you know, <laughs> they liked saving money. Um, but I was, I would douse myself with water uh, when I was a kid and then put a fan on my body and I would just be soaking wet with like a fan like on me. So I've always been afraid of heat. And, um, and, and so that's one of the things that, that I wanted um, that, that I felt like adding to Joan's kind of, you know, so the things that were, that were going to crack her out of her shell in a sense, it was going to be like sitting in the house was like sitting in like, like a nest kind of where she's like about to hatch because it's so hot. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I, I have a question related about the cover. Um, I love the cover. I've seen I've seen on social media people walking across the street, um, <laughs> reading the book, like in a busy in a busy crosswalk, no <laughs> concern. And the uh, after I saw that on social media, maybe on Sunday, and then Monday morning I was coming out of a parking garage in Chicago, and I saw a guy across the way, and he was carrying a book, you know, holding it like this, and I thought it was animal. So I'm like, isn't that the greatest book? And he he looks up and he he holds it where I could see it a little better, and it was the Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. I was like. Yeah, that's a good book too. Cole yeah, Whitehead yeah, knows yeah, what he's yeah. doing. Fantastic. I was like, but you should also read Animal. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, what was the process like for the cover? Because it's so beautiful. And you and Raven Leilani were talking about the cover of Liberty, maybe. Yeah, um, Liberty is gorgeous. And I was like, I was like wanting a little backstory about your cover. Yeah, I mean, well, Allison Forner is the person who was behind it at Simon and Schuster, and she's just she did Three Women also, and, and just. Uh, I just think has a real knack for um, for just really, for me, what I wanted the book to feel like um, and what I think she really perfectly did was I wanted it to, I wanted someone to feel kind of like cool holding it, you know, like it was kind of like a manifesto looking thing, um, which, I, which I think this is and I, and I absolutely um, love it for that reason and and for all the reasons i also love the cover the colors i think they're they're so cool um but yeah i i i also one of my friends said to me that it looked like one of the books that you see like in the 70s at like the town pool like one of and i just was like oh wow that is such a a cool um a cool thing that's i, I love that i love the idea of that so yeah, um, we went through a couple of different sort of iterations that were all really, really super different. Uh, and this one was just, I think, for me, the one that, um, and for, I think everyone, you know, um, liked it equally, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So. <laughs> I love it too. Um, so once upon a time, I was on Twitter many, many years ago. <laughs> when I was a, a young and fearless woman. <laughs> and I saw a huge debate between several female writers and they were talking about, is it fair to use the analogy or fair or accurate or worthy to use the metaphor of books as children? Like somebody had posted a picture of their book swaddling their manuscript. Uh -huh. And then it was like this pile on of like, a book is not a baby, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I have thought about that for years now. And I thought about it when I was thinking about your book coming out, like, Obviously, Three Women was a global sensation. It was it was everywhere. It was so much. And I have every conversation about animal also invokes three women. So the two part question is, what do you think about this me metaphor of books as children? And did, if, if you buy into it, which I guess I do, because part of me is like, oh, I'm a second child. So of course, I'm worried. I was like, I want animal to be able to stand on its own and not have to be in the shadow of three women. But but of course it is, and it's a book. And I'm just wondering like where you fall on that and how, if you felt any concern about animal being able to have its own moment, or if that just sounds as stupid, it's like half the writers on Twitter thought. No, 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 not at all. Um, well, first of all, regarding books as babies, I mean, I'm, I'm totally cool with 
people calling, you know, I don't, I think it's weird that people would have be angry that somebody would call their book their baby. Like, so what? Let them, that's fine. Like what, like people call their dogs or babies, like who care, you know? For me, it's always like, I just don't get why anybody would have a problem with somebody else wanting to refer to something as their baby. For me, is, is my book, my, you know, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't call my book my baby. It's not my kind of parlance, but I don't, I'm not against it or think it's weird. Um, in terms of animal coming second, not standing on its own, et cetera, that question, you know, I'm, I am concerned because I'm um, a, a people pleaser of the highest order, um, even though I do, you know, even though sometimes I'm, I seem like I'm not, I, I think I always fall back to that. Um, I, I, I'm worried about, you know, the readers who love three women not liking animal and letting them down in some way because it is very different. It's, it's a lot. It's very similar because it's the same writer with some of the same sessions, but you know, it is also different in a lot of ways and it's different in kind of a genre, you know, not just fiction to nonfiction. I think it's, it's, it's not, it's not the most natural, um, fiction, um, uh, fiction second kid to come from a nonfiction first, but it's mine, you know? And so for me, it's, it is normal and it is also a part of me and it's, it's complex, I guess, like we all are. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm fine with it on that level, you know, and I'm fine with whatever, with, with it being the second book after the, whatever, I'm fine with that. I, I literally, I just do not want people who like the room to be like, oh God, I hate, you know, it just makes me feel bad. Like I've like either hate them both or, or love them both, but please God, don't be disappointed in me. Don't make me, don't, don't feel guilty about having wasted money on like that. You know, that to me is, yes. um, so that's really where it, where, where I sit on it, but, um, on kind of a, an individual one by one basis, but no, I'm other than that. I'm, I'm pretty like, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Anne, and she says, how much of Animal was informed by the women's stories that became three women, and how were your writing processes similar or different between the two books? So Animal, in terms of being informed by three women, you know, like I was saying earlier, there were a lot of, um, of stories, a lot of the sort of mothering aspects of things that I didn't feel um, would be good for, would be a little bit too harsh for some of the three women storylines um were in there and a lot you know some stories from people I heard there's I, I I don't know what you know the percentage is because also at the same time that I was writing three women I was you know living my life over the course of that decade you know so it's um so it's hard to tell what but I was writing animal at the same time that I was kind of writing waiting for the sort of tie to tie in the stories of of the three women at the end um so a lot of the same things were in there but um and in terms of writing process uh i mean super different um because it, it was easier it, it was just it's frankly easier to write fiction um because for me because you're not dealing with other people and, and having to worry about them um, but, but similar in the sense that I, you know, I, I, I write much the same way. I, I don't, although no, with three women, there was more, there was a lot more like the, the cobbling together of things. Animal was really not that much cobbling. It was kind of writing straight through and three women was a lot of like, you know, I would have hundreds of thousands of words about stuff that nobody saw. Um, and so, you know, I didn't have that with animal, thankfully. Um, there's a comment that says, we love them both, meaning both your books. So oh. <laughs> that's, that's for real. Um, <laughs> Susan wants to know, what have you both been reading lately that you've loved? And I'll let you start. Um, I, someone, this author in the UK just recommend, Clover Straw just recommended to me, Die My Love. Um, and I just started reading it. It's, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. It's like Ariana, and then it starts with an H. But um, it's uh, it's it's so far so brilliant. It's fantastic. Um, and I just got Black Buck, 
And I just started looking at that because someone just told me about that yesterday. And I just started reading it because it was a person that I really trusted. And I don't normally start reading things right away. But so those two things, and I still have on my desk, which I love the secret lives of church ladies. Oh, um, do you like that too? I love it so much. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah. so embodied, so much sex. So I love that. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, so those, that's, yeah, that's pretty much that's what I'm reading right now. What about you? Um, I'm reading, I always have one physical book I'm reading and one electronic book. So cool. my physical book, I'm reading Little and Often. It's a memoir by Trent Presler about building a canoe with his deceased father's tools. Oh, and wow. it's, it's very, it's beautiful. And it's, um, what's that? Can you say it again? I want to write it down. Sure. It's called Little and Often. Okay. Thank you. And um, it's really, it's a beautiful, meticulous, meditation but it, it's it's livelier than that right. and I also I'm just about to finish Detransition Baby by Tori oh, Peters I want to I want to read that it's so great it's such right. it's a great story and it's really it's showed me how much I have to learn about the trans experience yeah. and I just I'm so grateful for the offering of the story to help me fill in like just a huge gap in my experience and knowledge. It feels like such a gift. Um, cool. All right, Christina, do you want to unmute and ask a question? I see your hand is raised. All right, maybe not. She did put a question in the oh, chat. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, I got three little kids and <laughs> do you want me to field your question I was you? just, oh I'll, I can ask it but they're good now um I was just wondering <laughs> what direction is your next work in progress and is it going to be something fiction or non-fiction I, I I'm going to write a book about um grief and I, I want it to be um slightly reported like three women and it'll be some memoir about my own experience too um but ultimately it is a it is going to be a story of of hope um and i'm excited about it wonderful <laughs> thanks um i think we have time for a few more questions if you have a question feel free to put it in the chat or you can raise your hand i have a question since i just reread your book for the second time and this is the first year I guess the past year is the first time I've ever revisited work and reread it because I always feel like, well, there's new things. I have to read the new things. Yeah, and there's yeah, only yeah. so much time, you know, oh, God, it's, I'm, it's just like, a, it's like a constant anxiety, um, one of the many. And I'm wondering, <laughs> is there, is there any art that you revisit either books or movies or music that you revisit that are sort of perform the function of like a touchstone or you've revisited it lately and how has that changed your experience of of the of the work itself yeah um that's interesting i i always i always revisit um uh joy williams short stories and lucia berlin um and uh grace paley i'm always rereading them i have them kind of um because and because they're the kinds of stories that you only you don't need to, I don't have the, um, the, the sort of wherewithal to read an entire, uh, like an entire book more than like, you know, several, like I, it, that's hard for me. I, I do bits and, and pieces because my brain is always kind of moving around. So if I've loved something once, I'll probably go back and read parts of it, um, pick up parts of it and read like six or seven pages at a time. But I, I wish, I would, I want to, have I want to read something straight through again and again sometimes but I have that feeling of oh god there's so much news I have to do this I have both because I get so excited about new books but also because I feel like I need to educate myself on you know I need to know I need to be conversant and in, in you know in, in yeah. the industry and whatever um so but yeah but I do do it I do do it in, in fits and starts in like you know six pages at a time yeah. And if you were going to cast the movie of Animal, who's Joan and who's River? Who's River? I, don't, you know I, mean? I haven't thought about 
Um, it's funny because we're doing casting for three women right now and like we've been meeting so many cool actresses and stuff and then someone asked me like oh who do you see like you know one of the main guy characters and I was like oh man I totally <laughs> forgot about the dudes and not because I'm not I don't care it's just like I, we've spent so like I guess that's the one good thing about being wrapped up in the kind of worlds in which I've created is that the men really you know have this this second tier thing um but but it is you know just in terms of like who the main stars would be kind of a thing but i have not thought about i don't know who do you see as joan i see well i don't watch enough tv and be like i sort of see it <laughs> for some reason i was picturing like a very young holly hunter <laughs> i don't know like yeah, i wanted like someone with long hair yeah. i feel like a mila kunis is a little mm -hmm. bit on the nose I wanted something in my imagination. I wanted it to be someone that has like a little less smoldering and a little more, like a little more, um, like just a little less yeah. distractingly beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> um, oh, so uh, Christina Power says Emma Roberts, <laughs> which is a good one. Great, great. <laughs> Thanks for the audiobook. Yeah. And if you have, if there's any aspiring writers on here, um, which I suspect there are. What, um, this is a little trite, but <clears throat> what kind of advice do you have <clears throat> for somebody that wants to write nonfiction or fiction or, or step out into the writing world? Like what's, what's something that is part of your practice that you can't live without that you really think is important for writers to consider or incorporate? Hmm, I mean, I, I, my, my number one thing, especially to like, you know, really new writers is to get something out to somebody else who can make a decision on whether or not to publish it. And whatever that, that path is, to make sure you know what the path is and not just to kind of go like, oh, you know, today I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna send this to my best friend who, you know, doesn't really do much reading, but like, you know, she's really nice. Like it, it, just kind of sending things around to, to people who aren't gonna be able to do something with it. It's something I, I really, I mean, I do care what, um, what other people think. I have ideal readers that I think about, but I do not, um, usually my, my editor you know, and, and my agent are, are the only people that I really send things to uh, before I, um, you know, I, I just, and, I'm not, and if you don't have an editor or an agent yet, I would say, you know, uh, an editor at a magazine, just, you know, email someone and say, hey, I have this idea. I, I always think writing with an end goal in mind, um, if you want to be a writer, is the right way to go and to kind of, to, and also just when you're done with something, just send it off. People are, all, there is no amount of perfect arithmetic to the right like formula where some where no one's going to hate it you know someone's going to hate it someone's not going to want to publish it but somebody somewhere one day is and for that you know just keep writing and keep sending it to people who might be that person not to your you know aunt who reads a little bit but doesn't you know is going to say nice things but not do anything for it great thank you thank you that's i'm going to take that advice myself <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're out of time. Do we need to hand it back to you, Kristen? No, I mean, this conversation can and should go on as long as you guys want. Um, but I just wanted to say a couple of things. And, and Lisa, if it's okay with you, read a passage really quick. Oh, gosh, sure. Let me just go get it. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> um, but, but before I get to that, um, Christy, you were talking about Jeannie Vanesco's Things We Didn't Talk About When I Was a Girl. Yes. And that book, coupled with um, Lacey Johnson's The Other Side, both by Tin House. I mean, the first one, Jeannie Vanesco's Things I Didn't Talk About When I Was a Girl. Any, any story that anyone is brave enough to tell of their experiences is fantastic and kudos and you should get all of the medals, but she brought in her rapist to tell his side of the story. Oh, wow. And it was just incredible. And, and I'm gonna read a quick um, sentence from her book really quick because she struggled with whether or not she could call it rape. 
Oh. And because it wasn't the, you know, um, penetration with a penis into her vagina, it was other things, but very much unconsensual and non-consensual. And um, she said, three times I type Mark raped me and then delete it. The term shouldn't matter, but of course it matters. The FBI revised <clears throat> its definition of rape because language matters. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact that, that we toy with this idea of whether or not something constitutes a violation of a particular kind is mind boggling. And, and your conversation about sanitizing the images and, and the language that we use, it, it's very much problematic. And anytime anyone champions whether it's fiction, nonfiction, this idea of giving agency and authority to telling these stories, I'm here for. So trigger <laughs> warnings and all of that, I understand and appreciate it, but the stories need to be told. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Chrissy, for bringing up Jeannie Vanesco, and thank you, Lisa, for, for three women, which is you know your interviews with three women and an animal for taking on a fictionalized but very real account of these sort of everyday transgressions that women face. And then the other side by Lacey Johnson is about a consensual relationship that starts out consensual and then he builds a room and this is a memoir of um, a room that he plans to kidnap and keep her in and he does and and she escapes and just i'm rattling on but you guys brought these up and and excellent books but um if i could read a little passage from animal oh yeah absolutely okay. I, i'm so glad i thought you were asking me to and i was like oh my god okay thank oh you. i would love for you to no 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 that. i don't want to i i don't want to i'm but i just like no no please i'm so excited kristen please you okay so it's not going <laughs> to give anything away for those of you who haven't read it but it will give you a little bit of flavor not only to your writing style but to join joan's point of view and also the reason why i want to have a cocktail with her <laughs> the bar, intended for after-work cocktails, began to clear at 9 p.m. The bartender opened the door, and I felt the cool spring air. I got cold. I was wearing a sleeveless dress. A man I knew from the bar came by with his coat, a thick patchwork pelt, and draped it across my shoulders. It was heavy, and it laid across my slight frame in a tyrannical manner. It wasn't a nice gesture. It was like he rolled his balls out and stretched the sticky dough against me. Men were always putting their coats around my shoulders. They mark their territory that way. It's better to freeze to death. <laughs> and that's just a snapshot of Joan and a snapshot of Animal and a snapshot of, of the everyday, like I said, transgressions that aren't necessarily welcome, but that are committed. Mm -hmm. And you see, as Chrissy mentioned, this sort of snowballing rage that builds up just from living and not necessarily the, you know, horrific tales of um, violence that we talk about and that Joan experienced in New York, but just this slow accumulation that builds up into this inevitable outlet that we all kind of need. And, and the writing, Lisa, phenomenal. And, and again, Joan, sure, there's things not to like, but um, I kind of tend to fall in love with flood. Oh, thank you. So thank you for three women. Thank you for the three women that you interviewed and three women, and I'm sure countless other women. And thank you for Animal. And Christina mentioned in the chat that Animal made her feel less alone. And I think that both of your works do that. And, and Christy, yours certainly too. Oh so the, the fact that you were both brave enough to do this and, and honest and forthright about it, thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you, Christy. This has been really fantastic. And thanks to everyone for, for coming. Really means and um, Thank you. I just wanted to say one more thing. We have one left of these awesome tote bags <laughs> that go with animal. And I mean, this quote, my God, I can't. 
<laughs> I am depraved. I hope you like me. That's Joan. So um, <laughs> feel free to stop by and get one or place an order and uh, we'll ship animal group, three women and anything else you could ever want. Lacey Johnson, Jeannie Venasco. And again, we get awesome events and we're very particular about the ones that we do host. I just don't know how we got so lucky to host you, Lisa, and you, Christy. It's incredible. Thank you. We have, I feel the same way. Thank you so much. Thank so, you so much. And congratulations, Lisa. The book is amazing. Yeah, congrats on the I can't, I can't wait to see where it goes and all the places, all the countries, all the <laughs> homes and hearts. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next time, and anyone who's watching, anyone who's in Chicago, come by the store, I'll have a cocktail, and then we'll just put like a little placard of Joan next to us, and we'll be having one with her. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so thank you again, everybody, and um, have a nice evening, and Lisa and Christy, if you could stick around for just a few seconds after we stop recording so I can thank you properly. Sure. But thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone.